previously on Cover Up. A person that drowns does not drown instantaneously. It's a fight. It's a fight to not inhale. She knew exactly that she's drowning. They were offended that people, they felt that people wanted to know if Mary Jo was pregnant, and they weren't going to give them that. I, frankly, was just amazed and extremely puzzled that no autopsy had been done. Well, I know damn well I didn't go out at night to talk to Leslie Leland about calling the grand jury or anything else. That's one thing I have positive recollection of. We were threatened, called and threatened, that that someone was coming coming to get us with a shotgun. Our room was broken into that night, and the individual who was coming to get us got a gun inside. What happened to me was tampering, and it was intimidation, and the grand jury was not able to do its job. I honestly mean this. I could never have gone up to that cemetery again if I'd known it had been disturbed. I'll be back. I'm Liz McNeil, and this is Cover Up. A body flown off the island before it could be properly examined. An autopsy denied. An inquest in which vital testimony was not allowed. The power and prestige of the most famous political family in America. And the atmosphere of fear and intimidation that persists for some, even today. It isn't hard to understand why nearly 50 years later, it's still so difficult to find out what really happened at Chappaquiddick. Peel back a layer that you think brings you closer to answers, and you find more questions. And the journey to find that truth is as fascinating as it is perplexing, presenting almost constant challenges. What, for example, to make of the story of Carol Jones? On the night of July 18, 1969, Carol, then 17 years old, was driving on Chappaquiddick Road back to her grandmother's house a little after 11.30 p.m., She has never spoken publicly about that night until now. It was pretty much like a clam. (laughs) I wasn't going to say anything. I just knew that what I saw didn't... uh, It was unfortunate. I didn't really want to see what I saw, and I didn't know what it meant, the significance of it. All I knew was that it didn't fit in with the, the tale that was being told. I was intimidated by the whole... All those men and the power and... Yeah, I was intimidated. It was scary, really. Last winter, Carol drove me around the island and showed me exactly where she was that night. This is where I was uh, the night of the accident at the Martin house. And I was uh, there for a phone call that my boyfriend was calling in. He was with the family's son. They were about 18 years old. They were bicycling across the country. And they had agreed to make a phone call at 11.15 that night here. And so the family told me if I wanted to talk to my friend Scott that this was the opportunity. So I took it. So I was pulling out of here around 11.35 after the call. And I made sure nobody was coming. But again, it was very unusual, especially at that hour, for anybody to be coming down this road. So here is where I was driving. And I had a VW bus, so the headlights were up higher. So right about here, I noticed a car coming up behind me very quickly. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, they better slow down. And instead of slowing down, they passed me on this curve right here and then pulled in front, back in front of me right here. And um, my headlights shone into the back of the car, and I could see two men dressed in white shirts on either side of a small person that looked like a young woman with short hair. She was squished in between them. And instead of making this normal right turn here, they went straight down the dike road. And at that time, I had thought about going down to East Beach just to think about Scott and think about how how much I missed him and that kind of thing, you know, being 17. And as soon as that car went down there, I thought, I'm not going down there. I don't know who those people are or why they're going down there. So I decided to make my turn and go back to the house. I couldn't see who was driving, but it was a white car. But I remember the uh, back of the, the window. It was big. It wasn't like a small window. It flew. I mean, they had to be doing 40, 45 
So Carol saw three people heading in the direction of East Beach towards the Dyke Bridge. She couldn't see the driver, but the three passengers were in the back seat of a white car. And there had been two cars at the party cottage that night. Ted Kennedy's black Oldsmobile and a rented white Plymouth Valiant, which was the car Ted, Joe Gargan, and Paul Markham said they took to the Dyke Bridge when they attempted to save Mary Jo. But Carol doesn't know if the white car she saw was the Valiant or not. Nor does she know if the encounter is related to Mary Jo's death. And Carol saw the white car speeding around 11.35 p.m., which was 20 minutes after Ted said he left the cottage, but still over an hour before Deputy Sheriff Huck Look saw Kennedy's black Oldsmobile. And the woman she saw in the back seat had short, dark hair, but Mary Jo was blonde. Carol found out about Ted Kennedy's car accident the next morning. I thought, oh my God, I forced that car to go down that road. If I hadn't been there, maybe they would have made the turn. And uh, But then when they pulled the car out, it was a black car. So I knew it wasn't the car I saw. And then when Kennedy came out with his uh, timing, I thought, well, I saw a car go down Dyke Road at the time he said he went down Dyke Road. But it was a different car. So it It was very confusing to me because that was a lie right away. I knew because I saw a white car go down the road, Uh, but I don't know what happened down here, of course. Yeah, it was uh, pretty weird. My grandmother was at the house with her housekeeper, and I told her housekeeper, who I trusted, what I had seen, and she told me not to say anything to anybody. She said the Kennedys are very powerful family and you don't know what you saw. I mean, you know what you saw, but you don't know what it means, what you saw. But she's told me that she has had a cousin who worked for the Kennedys in Hyannis. And her cousin had said that I would be killed if I told the reporters or if I told the police what I had seen. It was scary. It was a very scary time. And so I was very leery of the Kennedys and power John Kennedy being assassinated and Bobby being killed and, you know, all this stuff. It was a scary time. Carol is now 66 years old, a single mom of two grown kids, and she lives outside of Boston. Her family has had a home in Chappaquiddick for over 50 years. So why is she sharing her story now? Well, you know, it's been such a long time, and I just... I thought, you know, the truth has to come out sometime, hopefully, about what happened. And maybe someone would see the significance of what I saw and put to, you know, put it together. Uh, I think my cousin Bill has done a good job of it. I, a lot of people don't even know about Chappaquiddick anymore. So it doesn't seem as scary to me as it once did. We'd like to know just because we're from here and someone was killed. I mean, it was terrible thing and it changed our lives forever here bill is carol's cousin bill Pinney, who grew up in martha's vineyard and has written a self-published book chappaquiddick speaks he hired a physics professor to analyze photographs of the skid marks and car damage taken at the accident scene and he commissioned engineering studies to determine what had caused the damage he theorizes that the car accident was staged to hide an earlier accident which had seriously injured Mary Jo, a theory that was also the subject of an earlier book by Ken Capel, Chappaquiddick Revealed, What Really Happened. I spoke to Bill Pinney about his theory. So the more I started saying, but come on, Carol, it couldn't possibly. And the more she says it was, and I started thinking, what could that mean? What could that mean? And I realized the only thing it really could mean is that a real accident had happened that time, and the second time that the car was seen, they were staging an accident. But I realized that was the only one of about the eight, eight theories that had been uh, been suggested for what happened that night, including the possibility that Candy told the truth. I realized that was the only one that could fit with the event, you know, what Carol saw. And just to review the car damage, the right front and back windows of the Oldsmobile were blown out. The driver's window was rolled down. Only the rear left window remained untouched. The windshield was smashed into pieces, but held together by the safety film. The roof was also smashed, and both doors on the right had vertical dents. Penny's theory is complicated and far-fetched, and here are the main points. 
that the car was accelerated from a standing start and that the photographs indicate that the tire marks on the bridge could have only occurred from the accelerating rear tires and not the front braking tires. Secondly, that the force which created the dents in the passenger side doors and the passenger side windows could not have occurred from the impact from hitting the rail and hitting the water. Thirdly, he believes there is no way anybody could have walked away from an accident that damaged the car so extensively without significant physical injuries. From there, it spins out into scenarios that are hard to believe. And I don't believe his theory. But as we've explored, the multiple variations of the story, was Mary Jo alone in the car? Was there a third person in the car? Or could it have happened the way Senator Kennedy said it happened? The fact that the truth was never fully revealed, it was all part of the mystery of Chappaquiddick. Hi, this is Christina Everett, one of the producers on Cover Up. I have some exciting news for listeners of the podcast. We're giving away 50 Blu-ray copies of the Lionsgate thriller Chappaquiddick. If you didn't see it in theaters earlier this year, now here's your chance. To enter, all you have to do is go to our podcast Facebook group. Just search Cover Up and leave a comment on the pinned post about the giveaway to let us know you're interested. The winners will be selected at random and the giveaway runs from today until July 18th. See the pinned post for a link to the rules. No purchase is necessary to enter, and a purchase will not improve your chances of winning. The giveaway is only open to U.S. residents over age 18. Void were prohibited. Good luck. Whenever I'm at an impasse, I return to senatorial privilege, Leo Damore's book on Chappaquiddick, a book that entailed over 200 interviews and nine years of research, one based on facts, not theories. A man who devoted his life to getting the story right. Damore knew a lot, more than is revealed in his 496-page book. And as it turns out, there was more to his story than what he wrote. One with a shocking final chapter. Back in July 1969, Leo Damore was working for the Cape Cod News and selling shoes at a local shoe store in Hyannis Port to help pay the bills, which is how he knew everyone in town. He'd also written a book on a serial killer named Tony Costa from Provincetown and he'd grown close to Massachusetts State Police Lieutenant George Killen, who had led the investigation. Killen was also the lead investigator in the Chappaquiddick case. He told Damore the case had been the biggest mistake of his career, mainly because Mary Jo's body had been released without an autopsy. And in 1979, in their final conversation, as Killen was dying from cancer, he told Damore he wanted to send him something in case he never made it out of the hospital. Here, in a 1990 radio interview, Leo Damore explains how he got the package two days after Killen died. This is a, a man who at this time is waiting for the ambulance to come in order to return him to Cape Cod Hospital where he's going in for what was the last time. He says to me at the end of this conversation, I'm going to send you something, Leo. And I assume it's going to be something to do with the Costa case, uh, FBI handwriting analysis sure. or something because he had everything. A week later, I go to my mailbox. Here, here is a manila envelope with his handwriting, which is eerie enough to receive a letter from a dead man. But when I open it up, it isn't Costa at all. It's 10 copies of documents out of the district attorney's office having to deal with all the interoffice memorandum, letters from Kennedy lawyers demanding Mary Jo Kopechny's clothes and sandals be burned and destroyed, mm. and the fact that George does not want to do this because he regards this evidence as belonging to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But ultimately, he has to. They get a court order. I wondered how Leo Damore got the story that no one else could. So I reached out to his son, Nick Damore. He's a 32-year-old, 7th grade English and language arts teacher in Connecticut. I don't know what it was about Leo, but he, he I think he had a, a way of, of getting people to try to, like, seek help from him and he, I don't know if he manipulated them to kind of get information he was he, he was a very charming person um, you can hear that from his voice once he got these files from from Killen after he died I think Leo started to take it a little bit more seriously and you know he was lucky because he knew some some players uh, in the game he was he was a little unconventional in the way that he would go about things um, you know he was a shoe salesman on the Cape he like knew everybody people read his column 
he he was like a local guy, so people thought, okay, if I talk to Leo, he's not going to manipulate it. He's gonna he's gonna do the right thing because he's local. Demore got access to confidential legal documents and would convince many key people to talk, including Ted's cousin Joe Gargan, the man who told him Ted asked him to lie and say Mary Joe was driving the car that night when it went over the bridge. A story we explored in episode two. Demore never thought he'd get Gargan, but they had a mutual friend, Jimmy Smith. In the first episode, Smith was the guy who explained why the DA did not get involved, at first, in Ted's car accident. We treat this like any other automobile accident that doesn't have alcohol and death involved. That was the key. Hands off. We're not touching it. That's why we didn't get involved. It's a state police matter handling the district court. Jimmy Smith was the Dukes County Assistant District Attorney in 1969. He is now 89 years old and lives in Massachusetts. He had been an advance man in the political campaigns for JFK and RFK and had been invited to the reunion party that weekend in Chappaquiddick. But it was his wedding anniversary and he didn't go. And he had fond memories of teasing Mary Jo. I worked for Bobby in Pennsylvania. I ran Allegheny County. Each girl had a state. So <laughs> I called her Mary Jo Copacini <laughs> instead of most Copacini. <laughs> and she was one of the seven girls that had the key states. So I had to report to her every day on a private telephone. Jimmy was Leo Damore's neighbor, and he introduced him to Joe Gargan in 1982. I think the important thing you have to remember is that I did not come at Joe Gargan in the same way that the national media came to his door and said, in effect, I'm from Newsweek and you must talk to me, or I demand it. Uh, um, it wasn't that situation at all. It was almost a sort of uh, evolution. Um, we began talking. I, quite frankly, never thought I'd get Gargan. Joey and I became, I'm not going to say friends, but we began to cultivate the ground upon which he would be able to reveal to me what had actually happened to Chepokwitik without the anathema of being a snitch or without the feeling he was being disloyal. So I think it was for all of those reasons. I think very plainly, Joe Gargan, an honorable man who was misrepresented to the American people as a not honorable man, wanted, I think, the world to know not only what really happened at Chappaquiddick, but that Gargans were somebody too. I think there was a great amount there of pride of name and place. And I think for this reason, he began talking to me about this incident in this episode, but he was not easy. This, this occurred, our interviews occurred well over a year before I, I received all of the information and all, all of the revelations. It was very hard for him. And there were other reasons too. According to Damore, Joe Gargan was in financial straits because he had planned on a $250,000 inheritance from his Aunt Rose Kennedy and was shocked to learn, after 30 years of servitude to Ted, that she only planned to leave him $25,000 in her will. So long as he thought he would get $250,000 to $500,000, that was enough for him to keep his mouth shut about many things, Damore wrote. Even though his loyalty was betrayed often, and he was made to appear to be a stooge, a gopher, and an almost Kennedy. At the same time, Damore noted, he was struggling to cope with his alcoholism, a withdrawal that seemed linked somehow with his withdrawal from Ted Kennedy and the Kennedy family orbit. Gargan made a deal with Damore and signed a contract. He was paid a $2,500 retainer and ultimately $15,000 in consultation fees. And he would ultimately become Damore's key witness. Here Jimmy Smith explains their relationship. The issue was what really happened in Chappaquiddick. And Leo knew that I had access to the Kennedys. And I arranged for Leo to get money to Joe to get him out of a jam. They met in my office. 
and Leo had a tape recorder, and the money that was provided to get relief from an IRS obligation that was, Joe didn't have any breach. No other place does, in a way, to turn to, so he got temporary relief, and then eventually got himself squared away. There was just no one there but the three of us talking. Leo had a tape recorder. But Jimmy said it took Leo a long time to earn Joe Gargan's trust. Well, he didn't make a speech. He was there to answer questions. And then a lot of the things he didn't answer, Leo would say, did this happen? Was it like this? And he'd bow his head and say, keep talking, you know? There were questions, and there were answers, and then... When they got down to what was down to the real nitty gritty, Leo had a tape recorder. I I sat at my desk, and uh, uh, Leo was very thorough. and And they got talking, and then Joe got up and started to walk away. And at a critical time, and he got up and he was Leo was asking him the questions and. Joe Gargan was nodding his head and saying, keep talking, keep talking, and that's the way it went. I didn't open my mouth, and Leo got the answer he wanted by Joe bowing his head and waving a hand like, keep it up, keep it up. And Joe knew it was time to go, and he got up, and right at the end of the door, at the end of the carpet, he got to the door, and he bowed his head and waved, like, keep talking, keep keep talking. And, and But he knew, the, my opinion, he knew the tape was on. He was thinking he better get the hell out of there. That's all. So Gargan was cognizant, perhaps, of not wanting to say too much on the tape. He confirmed key points, but not always directly. And here was another layer a man being paid to consult according to the agreement, who, despite all the years that had passed since the accident, was still uncomfortable answering questions. But why? Another sign of how elusive the truth could be. Damore's book had revealed that Ted had not been in shock and had been fully capable of reporting the accident to the police, and that a state police investigator had been an informant for the other side and met secretly with one of Ted's attorneys, and his brother-in-law, and that the DA had told a colleague to tell the senator, I won't touch this case unless Ted wants me to. The book, which was published in 1988, was a condemnation of what Damore called the Kennedy apparatus, which he talks about with radio host Art Bell in a 1990 interview, and how it led his first publisher, Random House, to cancel his contract. The apparatus in Massachusetts is extraordinarily powerful, is extremely wealthy, and by and large, they control the media. Uh, there is so much propaganda that emanates out of Mr. Kennedy's office, and that it virtually blankets um, out everything else. After I handed in the manuscript, they canceled the contract, refused to publish, not because the information wasn't true, not because the information wasn't uh, relevant, not that it wasn't a good book. It was for other reasons, and the other reasons were that the Kennedy political apparatus had received a copy of the opening 280 pages of this book Mm -hmm. and did not want this information published. So they prevailed upon the chairman of the board of Random House, an extremely powerful man who decided that he would rather have Ted Kennedy as a friend than to publish this uh, this book. They took me to court um, in order to uh, reclaim the $150,000 of the advance, which had already been paid, right. but also as a wonderful a way not only to put the screws on me, but more importantly, to keep the book out of out out of the public area because any book which is under litigation is going to scare off a lot of other publishers the word would come down from above we don't touch this one in other words the 
knives uh, were out in New York Publishing, which is littered with former Kennedy aides, people with direct links to that apparatus. A small publishing house in uh, Washington, Gregory Gateway, had, had the courage to bring this book out. Uh, they didn't have any, any, any money for advertising. They didn't have any money for, for promotion. I hit talk radio. Actually, I, talk radio, probably more than any other media, was, was responsible for uh, this book immediately hitting the bestseller list. Regnery is a conservative publishing house. Damore, by the way, was a registered Democrat, and the book sold over one million copies. In response to the book, a Kennedy spokesman said, the charges about Senator Kennedy are false. The book is an irresponsible rehash of all the old rumor and innuendo, and we have no intention of making any further comment. When I began researching the story last fall, I spoke to a source who had been involved in the case, but was unwilling to go on the record. He's the one who told me you either believe Ted Kennedy or you believe Huck Look, the deputy sheriff who had seen Ted's car 90 minutes after he said it went off the bridge. The source also told me to look at Leo DeMorve's archives at his alma mater, Kent State University, where he had sent all of his book research a year before he died. Leo's son, Nick, thought that the tapes his father had made of his interviews, 30 hours worth with Joe Gargan alone, might be there. I think it's really interesting to know who has gone in and viewed his stuff and who's watched over that person's shoulder when they've been in there. How easy would it be to pull out box nine or box seven that has scrapbooks, but also has maybe the Joe Gargan tapes. Because to me, that's like the holy grail of this, I guess maybe the manuscript too, but finding the Gargan tapes, they're gone. I don't know where they are. With the hectic schedule, ordering online has been a game changer. And with Casper, you can now have your mattress delivered right to your door. Their products are designed to mimic the curve of a human body, which gives you that supportive comfort you need for a good night's sleep. The mattresses consist of multiple supportive memory foams that have the right amounts of both sink and bounce. And here's a cool feature. Casper's mattresses have a breathable design that will help you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. Casper offers two other mattresses, the Wave and the Essential. The Wave features a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. The Essential has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. The prices for these mattresses are affordable because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. Casper offers free returns in the U.S. and Canada if you're not completely satisfied. You can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. So how do you get the rest you deserve? Listeners of Cover Up can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash coverup and using coverup at checkout. Don't lose out on that offer. That's casper.com slash cover up and use cover up at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. On a snowy week in April, I went to the Kent State University Department of Special Collections. Among 19 boxes of Demore's files, notes, interview transcripts, photographs, and legal documents on Chappaquiddick alone were many perplexing and mysterious references to planes, to con jobs, and disappearing witnesses. Some were sourced and some were not. Some were probable and some seemed impossible. Demore might lead me to the truth, but it might require going down the rabbit hole. There was an anonymous note that the party guests, who were drinking heavily, were having drag races that night. And that's how the car went off the bridge, but that Ted jumped out of the car beforehand. Total bullshit, Demore wrote in the margin. There were references to Ted being flown off of Martha's Vineyard in the middle of the night, and no one in the control tower at the Edgartown airport. And about the Shire Town Inn clerk lying about seeing the senator at 2.25 a.m. that morning in order to provide him with an alibi. Leo wrote bullshit after that one, too. There were notes about the following morning, about Joe Gargan and Paul Markham showing up at Ted's hotel sopping wet, possibly because Gargan had just dove into the water to see if Mary Jo was in the car, which made me wonder, hadn't they tried to save her the night before? And there was more. Notes about the hotel guest who overheard Ted and Joe Gargan arguing in the room before the senator rushed out to make a phone call, leading investigators to wonder if he'd only found out about Mary Jo's death that morning. There were numerous references about an inquest scenario, and that Gargan had told Demore, we had a scenario that went from A to Z, 
that's never been disturbed. There was even a letter from Leo to E. Howard Hunt, the CIA agent and Watergate operative. In 1971, Hunt had traveled to Cape Cod to interview a man who said there had been a third person in the car. Hunt used an alias, wore a red wig, and used a speech deflector, courtesy of the CIA, for the occasion. A rabbit hole I did not go down. The interview tapes, there were 12 tapes of Joe Gargan, according to Leo's notes, would clarify a lot. But after two days of looking through 19 boxes of Leo's research, I hadn't found them. So I asked the librarian if she had any clue about where they might be. And she produced a letter that was not in the files. It's from Damore to the Department of Special Collections at Kent State, dated January 10th, 1994, in which he writes that a movie was being made based on his book, Senatorial Privilege, and that he was asked to keep the documentation until the film is in the can. That includes the tapes of Joe Gargan, Bernie Flynn, which are, of course, of great historical interest. In fact, the tapes now repose in my lawyer's safety deposit box. I immediately texted Nick, who's the lawyer? He texted back, I think it's Jimmy Smith. My producer, Christina, and I met Jimmy in February. He was funny, a good storyteller, and his home was full of Kennedy memorabilia. He made us laugh, but he also made us wonder, what did he really know? Leo Damore had referred to Jimmy Smith as his lawyer in his notes, so I called him. Do you have any idea where those tapes are now? I was a little pissed at him because he took all my notes. He thought, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you, don't you worry. And I had a box that I had all of my stuff from working for Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy in this box. And he said, I'll give it. I can see him now taking it. And then he gave it. To Kent State, he never got. I never got my stuff back. But Jimmy, were the tapes of the interviews with Gargan and Bernie Flynn? Were they in that box? Yeah, everything was in that thing. Everything I had was in that box. It was like a tomato soup can box. And can you tell me more about the tapes? How many tapes did he have? I can't remember all that. But he gave you the cassettes to keep. I can't remember that, all that stuff. So Nick thought Jimmy Smith might have the tapes. Jimmy says Leo had the tapes and gave them to Kent State. But Kent State said Leo gave them to his lawyer, who might be Jimmy, but I'm not sure. And Jimmy's not sane. Things were getting more strange, and they were about to get stranger. After Chappaquiddick, Leo Damore was looking for his next story, and he remembered a conversation he'd had with one of President Kennedy's closest confidants, Kenny O'Donnell. O'Donnell was part of JFK's Irish Mafia, the Inner Circle. And back in 1977 on his deathbed, he told Leo to pursue the story of Mary Pinchot Mayer. Mayer was a gorgeous and free-spirited artist who had had an affair with President Kennedy in the early 60s. She was married to a top CIA operative, Cord Mayer, whom she later divorced. On October 12, 1964, she was murdered while taking a walk on a towpath near her Georgetown home a murder that has never been solved, leading many to wonder, did the woman who was married to a top CIA official and sleeping with the president know too much? Nick says his father wanted another big story. Leo was always trying to build on what he had done before, trying to get bigger. And so, you know, what's bigger than Ted? You know, either Bobby or Jack. So he went after, you know, Jack. And I, part of me thinks that he didn't really get the message with Chappaquiddick, like, you know, back off a little bit. He talks about how he received threats. He talks about how people would call up the house in the middle of the night and say they were going to burn the house down. You know, there is that kind of underlying thing that you think, if I follow this thread, how much will it cost me in the end? What lengths will people go to to stop it? And I think that Leo just kind of kept pushing it a little bit. I asked Nick why one of JFK's closest confidants would tell Leo to chase the story of JFK's murdered mistress. I think that if he was loyal to JFK, then that is the story that should be told because Mary was almost... The reason that she was a threat was because she didn't want to stay quiet about what she had heard with the Warren Commission. She didn't buy it. And so 
to me, that tells me that Kenny didn't buy it either. You know, so it would be protecting JFK to go after it versus keeping it quiet, which would just kind of help the agenda of whoever perpetrated it, which is another <laughs> rabbit hole. It was Mary's diary that Damore was after. In the hours after her murder, Ben Bradley, who would later become executive editor of the Washington Post and who was married to Mary's sister, Tony, showed up at her artist studio, which was attached to his house. So did the chief of the CIA's counterintelligence, James Engleton. Both were looking for her diary, in which she apparently wrote about her affair with the president. In his 1995 autobiography, Bradley revealed his wife later burned Mary's diary. But Nick says his father claimed he had the diary. Basically, it was that Leo was getting too close. And at one point, he had claimed to have gotten this diary that outlined the relationship between JFK and Mary Pinchot Meyer. And so who knows? But I think as it got on, he got a little bit more desperate. So there was that doubt that creeped into people's heads that said, is he, is he really getting these breaks or is he inventing these breaks? So I don't know if he ever had the diary. If maybe it was burned and maybe he just claimed that he did and because he was, you know, spiraling. Leo also claimed he found Mary Pinchot Mayer's murderer, whom he described as a professional hitman connected to the CIA. But as with the missing diary, Nick wonders if his dad was losing his grip on reality. And he also thinks he may have started using drugs. I think what happened was with Chappaquiddick, he got Joe Gargan to talk. And it was like, sweet. I got the story. I can finish it. Here it is. You know, bombshell. With the Mary Pinchot Meyer case, he didn't have testimony as convincing as that. He had thought that he found the guy. And he had thought that he had a phone call with the guy. It was the first time that I had heard people thinking that Leah was maybe desperate and fabricating things. Damore was broke after his legal battle with Random House, and he was still getting threats, which had begun when working on senatorial privilege. I was receiving um, uh, letters put under my door, calls actually saying they were going to burn down my house, that I better back away from this. Uh, plus, of course, the tremendous economic and psychological pressures of having a lawsuit. Fortunately, I decided up until 1987, I had kept very quiet about this. By the mid-90s, Damore, who was divorced from his wife, was growing desperate and increasingly paranoid. On October 2nd, 1995, he shot himself in the head at his rental apartment in Essex, Connecticut. He was 66, and Nick was nine years old. I remember thinking... I should cry, but like, I couldn't, I just didn't, you know, my mom broke down, but that's what I remember thinking. I was remember thinking this isn't real, but it kind of felt real. I never went back to the apartment. Obviously it was a closed casket. And so for a while in the back of my head, when I was growing up, I kind of thought like, what if he's still alive? What if he didn't actually die? What if he's watching and like, is going to come out one day? and just kind of like show up again. You know, like maybe he had to disappear or something. Nick remembers their last conversation. He took me to um, this place in Ivoryton, a friend's house of his. And we have, there was like a really, really nice garden. Like it had a very lush, like lots of flowers and stuff. And we walked together. And I thought it was unusual because it was like, let's have a conversation. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of like a hyperactive kid. I was like, oh, let's run around. But he's like, you know, we need to talk. And he told me, if anything ever happens to me, there's a box under my bed for you. And that's what I remembered. And so when I heard that he had passed away, when the police officer came to our, to our house, I remember going in, we called it the piano room. I remember going in there and I kind of already knew. I like, I knew instinctively that that's what had happened. Not that he had shot himself, but just that he was gone. Um, and immediately that's what I thought. I thought, I got to get over there. He told me that it was only like a couple of weeks prior. Um, I got to get over there and I got to see it. But again, that was one of those situations where they said, no, you're too young. You're too young. Like, don't. So I never know what happened. I never, never got into that box. But I do remember after that conversation, 
it like piqued my interest. So when we got back and we were like, my dad was distracted typing or something. I went into his bedroom and I remember crawling under his bed and there was like a metal like lock box under his bed. And I knew it was in there. I think he said that there was some money in there and some other things, but I don't know what happened to it. Nick never found the box, but Leo left him a cassette with a taped message, which he's only listened to once. My mom gave it to me when I was 18. This is another example of like, here you go. We'll give you this little piece now. And the one thing that I remember about it, because I haven't listened to it since then, is that he regretted that he was never able to teach me how to make his sauce. And that's, yeah. My whole family just said, after this happened, I think this is why the estate went into disarray. It was just too much for everybody. And everybody just kind of was like, hands off. Let's put it in a box. Let's put it in the attic. Let's forget about it. Nick says Jimmy Smith led him to believe his father may have been poisoned. It seems crazy to think that his death had an element of conspiracy. But Nick does not rule it out. They thought he was poisoned, um, and he was getting more and more erratic and a little bit agitated. He couldn't collect his his thoughts. He couldn't write. He couldn't support himself. Uh, he started thinking his phone was tapped. He started thinking people were following him. You know, my uh, my mom and my dad actually got divorced uh, before the end of his life. It's, you know, easy well, divorce, and he was depressed, and that's mm-hmm. it. But... I don't think it was that simple. And I know that my mom carries some guilt with that. And she tries to kind of explain it to me. And she says, you know, it got dangerous for her um, because you have someone who has a total personality shift um, and can't, they're so passionate about what they want to do and they can't do it anymore to the skill level that they're used to doing it. It was just kind of like she could see the spiral going down. Um, and he, there was an autopsy done on Leo, and he had an undiagnosed brain tumor. And who's to say that that wasn't just something that was going to happen anyways? Um, but, you know, theories have been put to me that, you know, that's the way things can be done in the long term. Jimmy said to me, uh, a few drops can change anything. So I, I was like, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And, you know... Again, it was one of those kind of like leading you up to the edge. Come on, you know. So, you know, I've done some research and there there are some links between um, tumors and, and aluminum poisoning and it's a slow burn. It's not like somebody came in and, and framed a, you know, a suicide or something like that. Jimmy was one of the last people Leo had asked for help. Well, he was wound up. I know that. I don't know what the hell happened to him. But... He would call me in like a man drowning in desperation. Let me come up. I'll put a 10-year yard. It's like he's being chased. And I always suspected somebody might have put a drop in his drink or something, you know? I, I never in my mind totally believed he changed so dramatically. That was a big thing. It was the fact that he did, it was like a band being chased. He was long tight. All of a sudden, he was very much afraid, and somebody was, something was bothering him. He had to get away. He wanted to visit me, then he, week went by, he wanted to, let me go up there to just get away from here badly, you know. I can't handle you having a nervous breakdown around me. And he begged me, I'll put a tin in the yard. I said, get out of here. So Jimmy had also mentioned to me that somebody might have put a drop in his drink. Who or what was chasing Leo? And where was the manuscript of his Mary Pincho Mayer book? Nick is trying to find it. It's one of the many things he's trying to find out about his father. I spent a lot of time in Connecticut trying to forget what happened when I was growing up and just trying to be like, okay, you know, and not really thinking I needed to find out all these answers. But then as I got older, I, I had questions and there were inconsistencies. Why had Leo killed himself? What was in the box he left for his son under the bed? 
Where was his final manuscript? And where were the missing interview tapes? The man who tried to solve the mystery of Chappaquiddick had become a complete mystery himself. I admired Leo. He was meticulous in his reporting, and he was tenacious. He never gave up. And I was touched by the story of his son, Nick, who was so young when his father took his own life, and who was about to become a new father himself. I asked him how his dad's suicide had affected his life. I think that people who, who take their lives sometimes just feel like I'm such a burden to other people, and that if I'm gone, it's going to be so much better for their lives. But people, the families that are left behind, they think about it every day. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about it in some way. And because it just keeps rearing its head. It just keeps reminding you. There's there's reminders everywhere. So people who take their lives thinking that they're relieving their families from some burden are actually, you know, doing the opposite and kind of shackling them. Nick is now making a documentary about his father with the help of his best friend, who's a filmmaker. Once, so there was kind of like two threads. Like I felt like I didn't really know who my father was. I never felt resolution with kind of the end of his life and what had happened. And I heard whispers and things like that. So I I felt like it was kind of a thread to get to know who Leo was, explore a little bit more of the, the mystery towards the end of his life and the the unreally solved things and the things that are still lingering. And then also just kind of make sure his legacy is intact with the thing that he poured his blood, sweat and tears into, you know, he, he put everything out there for, for his work. Before he began his project, Nick visited his father's grave. He's buried in old Saybrook, which was kind of a strange choice. Um, He's actually buried across the street from where I attended middle school which was also very weird for me because I would be like getting off the bus and I'd just like look over and I'm like, he's over there. And he had a very small stone. It's not even raised. When I get some money, I'm going to replace it. Um, But it's basically kind of covered up. And it was one of the first things that I did when I decided that I really wanted to go for this project. I went over to his grave with my wife, uh, I just kind of told him what I was doing. His uh, his gravestone, um, it says, you shall seek the truth. So I kind of took that to heart. What a fitting epitaph for the man for whom that was a guiding principle. Leo had devoted his life to looking for the truth. Now Nick was looking for the truth. And so was I. In a way, all three of us were pursuing the same thing. Leo had gotten closer to the truth about Chappaquiddick than anyone else. But there was still more to learn about what happened that night. And I would soon discover a secret. A secret which could explain why the mystery has lasted for nearly 50 years. On the next episode of Cover Up. It's a string of events that would have broken a lesser man. It would have been easy for Ted to let himself become bitter and hardened, to surrender to self-pity and regret, to retreat from public life and live out his years in peaceful quiet. No one would have blamed him for that. That whole myth of this uh, single, bunch of single girls being sort of served up to uh, married men for some other purpose just didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, It was tragic. Mary Jo was my roommate. And um, that was very difficult. Changed everything. If this is the way it happened, why didn't they just say that? For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. Cover Up is a joint production by People Magazine and Cadence 13. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. To share your thoughts and theories on the case, you can join our Facebook group to continue the discussion. Just search Cover Up. For more, go to people.com slash cover up 
or to reach us directly, email coverup at people.com.